Good morning and welcome to Shattering Myths, a program devoted to the most vital segment of our society. To those of you like me who've come to realize that there's something dreadfully wrong about the religious and political institutions, the media reporting and military invasions that are all presenting themselves as part of the solution when we have come to know that they are indeed the problem. We realize that these institutions cannot be resolved by changing the color of the deck chairs on the sinking ship of state. So rather than trying to rearrange them, our mission here is to understand who is causing these tragedies, why they're doing so, and what the consequence will be of these events as they go unchecked over the next 5, 10, and 15 years. In our second hour, we're going to engage God on his terms through evidence and reason. We'll return to the conditions that existed in the Garden of Eden because that is where we are headed. Yahweh's instructions regarding his covenant provide the only glimmer of hope in an exceedingly troubled world. Our phone number, anytime over the next two hours, if you would like to participate in this discussion, it's 877-300-7645. I couldn't help but notice in the news that uh, Obama has uh, tried a, uh, uh, a different uh, approach to the deadlock in Washington regarding both the debt ceiling and the funding of the U.S. government. He is uh, now referring to what everyone who has been in his position previously called negotiation and compromise, the art of politics. He now calls it extortion. So if you want something and you and somebody else wants something else and you have a discussion so that you work out a compromise so both people perhaps get a little less than what they uh, uh, ideally wanted but in the spirits of uh, political negotiation you work out a compromise then uh, that kind of thing and debate is completely uh, unacceptable to this president we, we're going to call that extortion. We're going to say it's illegal. Extortion is illegal. And so the political system where opposing views are debated and resolutions are obtained by popular vote, we're going to say that that now is illegal, according to this president. He has most certainly taken on a dictatorial stance. He is presented himself as the Messiah of America, the savior of this nation, when he is, in fact, nothing but a megalomaniac. I'd like to return to the story we were talking about, uh, that this megalomaniac, thinking that he had the right to go wherever uh, his military could uh, intervene, no matter whose sovereignty was uh, being uh, uh, abused, and we sent uh, our troops into Libya and Somalia over this past weekend. There's a little more to tell about uh, Zubir, the 36-year-old uh, that was uh, running the lads. Um, Al-Shabaab is uh, called the lads. It's a uh, Islamic terrorist group uh, that previously had no affiliation with Al-Qaeda, although it was always said to be linked to Al-Qaeda. Uh, Osama bin Laden didn't like the mindset of Zubir or the lads thought that they were undisciplined and so he wanted nothing to do with them. We had learned yesterday that Zubir's education had been provided in a madrasa in Pakistan, which means that his education was fundamentalist Islam. It had been paid by Saudi Arabia. That is an extraordinarily important clue in terms of understanding the world as we find it today. The realization is that Saudi Arabia is the fuel that uh, propels the Islamic war machine. If Saudi Arabia, uh, and in addition to Saudi Arabia now also Kuwait and Qatar, were to be constrained from providing Islamic educational facilities and weapons to Islamic jihadists, Islamic terrorism would not be projected outside of the 55 Islamic countries. It would be constrained to being perpetrated on one another as opposed to the rest of us. According to a U.S. diplomatic cable, one of those that was leaked uh, via WikiLeaks, uh, Zubair rejected an initiative in 2009 by Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi 
to mediate in Somalia. Yes, the guy that America went in and killed wanted to mediate the terrorist onslaught that was taking place in Somalia. This is something America tried and failed miserably. This is something the UN has tried and has failed miserably. Muammar Gaddafi was willing to do the same thing, but we saw fit to kill him. Uh, it was uh, rejected by Zubir because Zubir's comments was, in reality, democracy is something that Allah has made unlawful, and someone else cannot make it lawful. We hear a lot of rhetoric where uh, Muslims are said to be uh, participating in the democratic process. We hear rhetoric about the, the misnomer of the Arab Spring, where Muslims were uh, striving for democratic freedom. Well, that is a, an ignorant and irrational statement. According to the Quran, and Zubir, having been educated at the Madrasa, knows this better than, of course, any American or Western journalist. According to the Quran, democracy is unlawful. The Quran says that there is no choice, that once the religion of Islam has been chosen for a nation, for a people, for an individual, they have no option and they must comply. The Quran and the Hadith order Muslims to follow Allah's and Muhammad's orders. They are not free. They cannot choose. They are told to follow the generals and the caliphs and the, the imams when they, and do whatever they are told to do. Islam is about predestination. It's about Allah acting as a Lord. There is no choice. There is no free will. It is wholly incompatible with democracy. Always has been. Always will be. It is not a surprise that the 55 Islamic countries are either resolutely dictatorships or they just make a, an illusion of democracy. Very much like the kind of democracy we witnessed in Egypt. When they were actually given one person, one vote, and they could vote for whoever they wanted to, they did what their imams told them. Their imams in the mosque said, you will either vote for the most fundamentalist Islamic candidates, of which the Salaf Party and the Muslim Brotherhood were comprised, or Allah would prevent them from entering the Islamic paradise and would torture them in hell. That's what they were told. That's what they did by a two-thirds majority, almost three-quarters. They elected the most fundamentalist Islamic leaders because they were following the orders of their imams. Most were illiterate. They simply voted for the logo, which were everything from umbrellas to bananas, that their imam told them to vote for. Because that's what they were told Allah demanded. And then what happened? The military took over in a coup. It is the history of Islam. This man has told you the truth, that democracy is something that Allah made unlawful, and someone else cannot make it lawful. The primary edict, the book that Muslim jihadists pay the most attention to, besides the Quran and the Hadith collections, were written by uh, Kutub. Kutub was educated in America, much like uh, Mohammed Morsi, the uh, uh, deposed president of Egypt. He wrote uh, signposts along the way and in the shade of the Quran. The books are written very similar to Prophet of Doom. Prophet of Doom takes the Quran and the Hadith and, and puts the Quran in the context of Muhammad and reorders it chronologically so it can be understood because the Quran itself is a jumbled mess. So written the same way as my Prophet of Doom. The, the only difference is Kutub thinks that Muhammad's orders to kill everyone who isn't a Muslim, to uh, that legalize kidnapping and rape and pedophilia, mass murder, the torture of, uh, of non-Muslims, Kutub thinks that's good because he actually thinks that Muhammad did receive these revelations from God. I think they're bad because it's obvious that Muhammad was inspired by Satan. But other than the conclusions, the context of both books are the same. In Kutub's book, he makes it absolutely clear that according to the Islamic Quran and Hadith, a Muslim cannot be peaceful. 
that they must fight jihad until the entire world surrenders to Islam. Having been educated in a madrasa, thanks to the grant from Saudi Arabia and the schooling provided by Pakistan, Zabir recognized that that was the case. Al-Shabaab came under greater pressure from the African Union stationed in Mogadishu, and, uh, and that is why um, our terrorist leader of the lads decided that he would uh, commit a number of suicide bombings. Uh, the first of those uh, killed 23 young men and women at a university graduation ceremony in Mogadishu. It was such a brutal attack and killed Muslims that many uh, people turned against al-Shabaab. Those who did, al-Shabaab killed. Uh, the imposition of uh, Taliban-like law, this uh, article reads, alienated large segments of the population in uh, southern and central Somalia. Well, the fact is there is no Taliban-like law, and it's just absurd that someone would write this. There is Sharia law. Sharia law has nothing to do with the Taliban. It has nothing to do with al-Shabaab. Sharia law has everything to do with Muhammad. Sharia law is based entirely on Muhammad's words and deeds. There is no other component of Sharia law. And since Muhammad's words and deeds are chronicled primarily in the Hadith, Sharia is comprised of the Islamic Hadith. The brutal, uncivilized, savage legal system that is imposed by Sharia is not the fault of the Taliban. It's not the fault of al-Shabaab. It has nothing to do with Zabir. It is the residue of Muhammad's perverted life. Period. And it is what every Muslim is compelled to implement because that's what the Quran orders them to do. One prominent al-Shabaab member, an American, Omar Hamarimi, said in a video last year that uh, there were elements in the group that were trying to kill him. He uh, followed up uh, with a series of tweets this year attacking Zubir. Abu Zubir, he wrote, has gone mad. He is starting a civil war. Oh, it's the nature of Islam. Even in a country where 99% of the population is Islamic, there can still be a civil war. The case is, uh, is being borne out before our eyes in Iraq, in Somalia, in Syria, and in elsewhere. We'll return to Shattering Miss after the commercial break. <laughs> Welcome back to uh, Shattering Mist. I'm going to uh, stay in the same part of the world. Um, you recall that America decided that it would be appropriate to bomb the military um, and residential uh, establishments uh, controlled by Muammar Gaddafi. That uh, uh, this same fellow, of course, that wanted to intervene in Somalia to try to resolve the civil war, but well, we decided that uh, we wanted him dead. Now, Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, has been a bad guy. There's no question about that. Uh, he had mellowed considerably uh, over the uh, the years um, and was probably as benign a dictator now as there uh, could be found in the Islamic world. But uh, nonetheless, the United States decided that uh, it wanted him dead, and uh, it thought that, that if we uh, provided arms by way of Qatar to the jihadists, the same jihadists, by the way, that we were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. You have the, in terms of imported jihadists, the highest percentage per capita of the jihadists, the foreign jihadists uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq that were killing Americans came from Libya. And so it was the same, it literally the same jihadists that we were fighting to kill in Afghanistan and in uh, Iraq we were now providing weapons to in Libya. Um, we were providing surface-to-air missiles. We were providing rocket-propelled grenades. We were providing 50-caliber machine guns. We were providing assault rifles, and they used them, and they toppled the government, and now the government of Libya is comprised of Mujahideen. It is a literally a government comprised of Islamic terrorists. It has become the ultimate arms bazaar for the Islamic world. If you are an Islamic terrorist and you wish to perpetrate havoc, that's where you go to get your weapons. Well, as
as uh, as a result of what America and Europe did in Libya, torture and ill treatment resulting in death is widespread in Libyan jails, according to the United Nations. So, you know, if you're a jihadist from a rival gang, if you are someone who is prefers a political solution, a peaceful solution in Libya, as opposed to a government of jihadists, you'll be thrown in jail, you'll be tortured. The UN report says that torture is most frequently used immediately after the individual is captured, and that for days thereafter during interrogation. The United Nations estimates that about 8,000 people are still being held and tortured since the 2011 conflict ended with the overthrow and death of Colonel Gaddafi. The vast majority are being held without due process. Torture is being used as a means to extract confessions or other information, the United Nations says. It notes that a big factor in the ill treatment and torture of detainees is the current situation of prolonged detention at the hands of armed militias. Yes, we have a government in Libya that the American military enabled that is strictly jihadist. It's why they killed the American ambassadors recently, why they attacked the Russian ambassadors' uh, residents as well. Talking about Islam again, uh, we're going to move this time to Pakistan. This is a really an odd story, but it just shows you the depths of intolerance that goes along with Islam. A crowd of Islamic fundamentalists, this is from Reuters, they actually wrote, Islamic fundamentalists, a crowd of Islamic fundamentalists dug up the grave of a Hindu man in Pakistan, police said on Tuesday, the latest sign of growing religious tension in the increasingly unstable Pakistan. Shouting Allah U Akbar, which they uh, put in quotes, God is greatest, uh, at least they got uh, the ist part right. You know, it's uh, most of the time they just write God is great. Uh, Allah is not the Arabic word for God. It just isn't. And it, it would take 15 minutes of research to prove that conclusively. Allah would be unknown to us if it was not for the Islamic Quran and Hadith. In the Quran, Allah is the name of uh, the word for God. It's used throughout the Quran. It's based on Hebrew. And so it's based on the Hebrew Allah. And Allah is the word for God. Allah, the Quran says, is the name of the Islamic Allah. And so Allah, U Akbar, is Allah is greater, greatest, biggest, or oldest. And so it's, it doesn't take any amount of investigation to get the facts right. But yet, the media can't seem to do it. They want to make it sound like any religious wacko that is uh, speaking of God is addressing the same God. It just isn't true. So shouting Allah U Akbar or uh, Allah is greatest, the crowd dug out the body and dragged it through the streets. Imagine that. You know, Muslims will, will go off and kill anyone who isn't a Muslim, or they'll kill peaceful Muslims just for giggles. But in this particular case, a man died, and they couldn't even let his body rest. They dug it up, and they paraded it around town. stay in the same part of the world, in the world of, uh, of Islam. Uh, this is a, a story about another country that America broke. Um, you know, it's, it, you should surmise by all of this that uh, when America invades a country, whether it be to uh, what we did over the weekend in Libya or in Somalia, what we did in Pakistan uh, and are doing in Pakistan with our drones, but our, uh, our special forces, what we did in Afghanistan and Iraq what we wanted to do in Syria have uh, negative consequences. Well, this is the Iraq that we left in our wake. Bombs exploded across the Iraqi capital on uh, Monday, killing at least 38 people. Uh, suspected uh, Sunni Islamist militants, these would be fundamentalist Sunni Muslims, um, are in the midst of 
pursuing a campaign against Shia Muslims because, well, the when Saddam Hussein was in power, although he was a secularist um, and an ally of the United States, actually, uh, and the principal agent that was opposed to Iran, that was keeping Iran from being able to develop its nuclear ambitions. But America saw to it that he was killed. So uh, what we got was a Shiite government in Iraq, because the Shiite imams in Iraq, all of whom grew up in Iran, all of whom are, um, are brethren with the mullahs in Iran that run uh, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, that they said the same thing that we witnessed uh, recently here in Egypt. They told all of the uh, people in, uh, in Iraq that once America had uh, provided the opportunity for a vote, there would be a vote, and that Allah wanted them to vote for the Islamic candidate, and if they didn't, Allah would roast their riches in hell. So they did. And now uh, the country is uh, controlled by Iran and Shia Islam. Well, the minority Sunnis don't like that very much, and because the Shias are treating them like they were animals. Because in Islam, if you're a Shia Muslim, from your perspective, you've been indoctrinated to believe that a Sunni Muslim is an infidel, and vice versa. Yahweh, in his first prophecy regarding Islam, speaking of Ishmael, whom Muslims and Muhammad in particular claim that their religion was derived from, he said that, they will be wild asses of men, and their hand will be raised against their brother, their brother's hand will be raised against them, and they will live in hostility with the whole world, which is precisely what we have seen. Eight of the ten blasts that uh, took place on Monday were in Baghdad, uh, and mainly Shiite districts, but there was also an explosion in a mixed area that was predominantly Sunni Muslim, which means the Shias are also bombing back. But the way that they bomb is to kill civilians. There is very little attempt to take out um, military units. Muslims kill principally by using terror tactics. You know, when America invaded Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan, while it was completely counterproductive in both cases, America at least made an attempt to target principally uh, the jihadists. Uh, the jihadists are civilians, of course, so it's a, you know, they still were killing civilians, but Nonetheless, there was at least an, an attempt to target uh, the jihadists. And when you do that, you're still going to have lots of collateral damage. And, and so we killed a lot of women and children. And when we did so, the Muslim fundamentalists used the killing of Muslim women and children to say that America is, a, is killing Muslim women and children, a fact, um, not by intent, but nonetheless a fact. And they used that as the rallying cry so that for every Muslim jihadist that we killed, they were able to recruit a thousand more based upon that reality. But the part that Muslims don't think about is that Muslims kill infinitely more Muslim women and children than do non-Muslims. And to say infinitely, that, of course, is a bit of an exaggeration. But it's probably in the range of a hundred to one, maybe even a thousand to one, that Muslims murder a thousand Muslims for every Muslim that a non-Muslim kills. It is a, it's an atrocious religion. And so it's based, it's, it's rage against the rest of the world is based on pure hypocrisy. In the deadliest of these attacks in Iraq, a parked car blew up in a commercial street, uh, killing five people in, um, in what was nothing but a residential and business district. There were other roadside bombs um, in uh, northern Baghdad earlier on Monday, killing six people here, eight people there, another four here. The surge of violence has killed more than 6,000 people across Iraq um, this year. The... Uh, Journalists, we'll put that in quotes, always like to say that, you know, it was a, that Iraq had become so much more peaceful since the civil war that erupted between Sunnis and Shias in 2006 and 2007. And by comparison, they were killing fewer of each other than they were back then. Well, now they can't say that anymore. But also, in 2006 and 2007, that civil war was caused by the United States. 
We had invaded the country. We had broken it. We had taken the country away from a secular dictatorship and given it to an Islamic government loyal to Tehran. And as a result, the civil war that broke out in 2006 and 2007 was America's fault. We created it. And so to use that as a benchmark, as opposed to the benchmark of pre-invasion, where there was less than two terrorist attacks per year on average, and now there's an average of about 20 a day, is foolish. This article says, and this is really uh, uh, incredibly uh, naive, it says, at the time, Sunni tribesmen banded together and found common cause with U.S. troops to rout al-Qaeda, forcing it underground. But al-Qaeda has reemerged this year to join forces with fellow militants in neighboring Syria. Every bit of that is a lie. There was no al-Qaeda presence whatsoever in Iraq before the U.S. invasion. Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein were enemies. They were not allies. And the awakening program was the program America conceived to provide weapons to Sunni Muslims so that they had a way to defend themselves against the Shia militias that America had armed. And they did not turn against or work in cooperation with America to rout out al-Qaeda. They used their weapons to begin a civil war against Shia Muslims. And it is those same Sunni Muslims and those same weapons which were the ones initially used to turn a peaceful protest in Syria into a deadly civil war. America's weapons and America's jihadists crossed the border to fight a battle that they had a better chance of winning there than they did in Iraq thanks to America's weapons being deployed against them in Iraq. That's the truth. They don't like the truth. And so there's this myth. And if you have to recreate your history to make it look like you did something that was wise that just happened to later blow up in your face, as opposed to something that was stupid at the outset. When, when America said it was going to use this awakening program to arm and pay and to dress up and, and train Sunni militias to... Uh, in Iraq with the idea that they were going to oppose other Sunni Muslims, the moment it was announced, I said, this is suicidal. This will be, and I even explained what the consequence of this was going to be. And it turned out exactly as I had predicted. And now we're trying to make it sound like, oh, it was really a good idea. Next paragraph of this article, the civil war in Syria has put acute pressure on Iraq's delicate sectarian balance. No, it hasn't. There is the opposite of that is true. It is the America having broken Iraq and armed Iraq that enabled Iraq to instigate the violence that we're seeing in Syria. It isn't Syria that has influenced Iraq. It's Iraq that influenced Syria. Had America not invaded Iraq, there would be no Syrian civil war. The Syrian civil war is being fueled principally by Sunnis in Iraq, by Saudi Arabia, and by Qatar. The reason they are doing so is that after America's invasion of Iraq, Iraq's, so Iran's enemy was now Western Iran. Iran essentially controls Iraq. And by doing so, Syria, that had been an, a, an ally of Iraq, was now an ally of Iran. And so the Iranian influence spilled west. They were no longer fighting a war. They now controlled Iraq. They now controlled Syria. They now controlled Lebanon. Their influence was on the rise. And because their influence was on the rise, the Sunni Muslims in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, and elsewhere felt threatened. And that is what caused this war. Had America not invaded Iraq, there would be no Syrian civil war. It's stunning that people who are paid to write news can't figure out cause and effect. And here, they have it in reverse. 
They have the civil war in Syria putting pressure on Iraq's delicate sectarian balance. First, there is nothing delicate about the 1,300-year carnage that has taken place between Sunni and Shia Muslims. Nothing delicate about it at all, never has been, never will be. Yahweh, 3,500 years ago, told us that they would be wild asses of men. Their hand would be raised against their brother, their brother's hand against them. Speaking of the Sunni-Shia divide. And Syria was caused by Iraq. The Iraq problem was not caused by Syria. Then it uh, reads in the parting comment, the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant claimed responsibility on Sunday for a rare bomb attack uh, in the usually peaceful Kurdistan region last month. Now, the Kurds just want nothing to do with them. The Kurds are an interesting story, of course, because they are the largest racial minority without an autonomous homeland. Largest in the world, about 30 million of them. They're oppressed and abused by Islamic Iran. They're oppressed and abused by Islamic Iraq. They're oppressed and abused by Islamic Turkey. Uh, they're literally treated as animals in those countries. And yet the Islamic world would tell you that a mythical people, those claimed to be Palestinians, which have no racial context whatsoever, that have never been a nation, that have never been a people, that are literally based upon a lie and a myth, that they have a right to a, a place that has never been theirs, where the Kurds have occupied and been a nation and been a racial people in that region of northern Iran and northern Iraq and eastern Turkey for millennia. And yet they do not have a homeland, and they are treated like savages by Muslims. We'll return to Shattering Myths after the commercial break. Back to uh, Shattering Myths. This uh, next story is, uh, is going to be uh, PG-13. Uh, it is an uh, extraordinarily sad story, but it, uh, it also expresses the nature of Islam. It is important for us to know these things because when we have media reporting that is so errant about Islam, giving the impression that, that the religion is a good religion. I mean, the President of the United States has gone out of his way to express all the wonderful attributes of Islam. Uh, there are none. I mean, Islam is the most caustic, the most deadly, the most deceitful, the most destructive religion that man has ever conceived. Everything that it has touched, it has destroyed. And we need to know that, because the more caustic you recognize that Islam actually is, whether you look uh, in today's newspaper or you look at the stories, uh, the Hadith and Quran depictions of Muhammad's words and deeds and his hellish terrorist existence, that is always the consistent story. Well, a Saudi preacher, an imam, not, uh, we're not talking about you're just a Saudi citizen. There's a lot of wackos out there. This is a Saudi religious leader, a preacher, an imam. He is accused of torturing his five-year-old daughter and beating her to death. Now, he was going to be freed because the uh, Quran allows Muslim men to kill women, their wives, their daughters. They're authorized to do so. The Quran and Hadith authorize men to rape whomever they please. The Quran and Hadith authorize pedophilia, which is going to enter into this case. Muhammad's um, farewell sermon specifically talked about approving beating of women. So he was going to be freed. There was nothing that he did here that is opposed to Islam. In fact, he was following Muhammad's example. But people in the West who heard about what this man did made it impossible for the Saudi ruling thugs, the Fads, to the Al-Sads, if you will, to free him. He had to serve some time and have some punishment. Otherwise, they would be viewed as savages around the world, and that would hurt them in their pocketbook. So here's the story. He is going to be uh, he's sentenced to eight years and 600 lashes. 
The case of Fayhan al-Ghamdi made the headlines around the world earlier this year, which is the reason that we that he was finally sentenced, when the Saudi court said that they were going to let him walk free. Activists began a campaign, not in Saudi Arabia, but in the rest of the world, where it would hurt the Sauds in their pocketbook, that was named after the daughter that had been beaten and murdered. It was called I Am Lama. To press the, the authorities in Saudi Arabia, which is a dictatorship, to prevent the father the Islamic preacher, from being freed after having beaten and murdered his daughter. Al Gandhi is a, uh, is a religious spokesperson in uh, Saudi Arabia, and the horrific details of the abuse of his daughter, Lamda, were pretty hideous. He was, uh, according to the medical records, from the hospital where she was treated for 10 months before she died, her injuries were so bad that she suffered for 10 months after they were inflicted, and then she finally died. Her ribs were all broken. Her fingernails were torn off. Her skull was crushed. She had been beaten with a cane and with electric cables. She had also been burned by her father. Now, the father said that he was required to beat her because she was no longer a virgin at five years old. Oh, Daddy knew that she was no longer a virgin. You might want to know why. Because he himself raped her. This is the story of what Islam does to a person. Muhammad was no better. If you think that it is politically correct, enlightened, to tolerate this religion, to encourage a mutual acceptance of a religion that does this to an Islamic cleric, then there's something deficient in your brain. If you are tolerant of Islam, if you wish to do as the President of the United States does and speak glowingly of this religion, even if you just say, let them be, and you're not willing to hold Islam accountable and to expose and condemn it, then may I suggest that you're immoral, that you haven't a functioning conscience. It is the only rational thing to do is to expose and condemn this religion for the sake of those that it routinely abuses like this little girl.